All right. So, um, if y'all have been joining us through this little journey through Romans so far, we've we've just started this last week, and um, we're up to verse sixteen. Uh, we we've been going slow and, and enjoying the process and everything. This. You can go back and watch those previous streams. They're all on YouTube if you want to go see the exhibition point socials, exhibition point YouTube. Um, but go check those out if you want to, to see everything that we've talked about so far. Um, especially these first seven verses, there's so much in there. It's it's awesome. <laughs> um, and we talked about the purpose of that and, and, and all that and what Paul was laying out, uh, writing to a church he had not been to yet, but knows of their faith and is encouraged by that and wants to be a blessing to them. But he lays out uh, like so much doctrine just in that opening uh, little prescript. It's, it's incredible. Um, uh, the longest writing in all of uh, ancient Greek or uh, old Greek um, writings, the, the longest introduction. Um, of a, a letter of this type. Um, we also talked about the focus uh, on the gospel in this letter specifically um, and how the words for gospel or uh, evangelize are used uh, 11 times throughout this letter, but eight of them are in either this intro or the outro. Uh, so a lot of really cool stuff. Um, but today we really start getting into the meat of it. So uh, last time we we did a big bulk. We did uh, eight through fifteen because um, it was not as as uh, meaty as one through seven. So we were able to move a little bit faster. Um, but talked about his his desire to be with them and uh, the purpose behind that and everything. So now he really starts to get into it, and we're picking up at verse sixteen. Uh, thank you for the lurk, Ray Will. Um, Ace Prestige, good to see ya. Good morning. Um, so yeah, oh, thank you for adding that, SG. And I see those those prayer requests. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, um, and just a reminder, this is just um, the stream. We're just working through it together. Um, I may end up chasing some rabbits as I'm just diving into it myself and feel free to ask questions and, and whatever, uh, and we'll chase those rabbits too. Um, so that's kind of what we do and just hang out together and drink our coffee and spend time in the word. By the way, exclamation point coffee for some really good coffee from a Christian based company. Use my code for 10% off. Just throwing that out there. Romans 1 16. Popular verse. Most people know it. Love it. Hashtag ad. <laughs> says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Um, so, uh, he's reminder, just to give us a little bit of that context, I've already kind of told you some of that, but remember what he was just talking about of wanting to, to come to Rome and, and preach to all who were there Um deliver that to all the Ro Romans. Uh, and he said in 14 and 15, I'm under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians. We talked about that um, differentiation and why he uses that word, both to the wise and to the foolish. So I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. And he immediately says after that, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So let's uh, jump back over to uh, this commentary and we'll read through it and discuss and highlight things and all that as we go. Uh, so here's kind of his introduction to this section. It's just on 16 and 17 because in this, before I read his, I'll, I'll share some of mine. Um, I love, and we'll get to it whenever we get to verse 17, but this, the gospel itself is the revelation of God's righteousness. That sounds like what? Those are just weird Bible words. What does that sentence mean? <laughs> um, but for in it, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, it says. Um, so I want to understand God's righteousness. What does that mean? How do I know it? It's revealed in the gospel. When you understand that, Every time I stop and just dwell on that truth and think about that, it like breaks me down. <laughs> it makes me like want to cry. It's so such a, a powerful thing. Um, but we'll get into that as we as we go. So let's let's read some of what he says here. And again, this is Douglas Moose. Um, 
commentary, The Letter to the Romans, second edition out of the New International Commentary of the New Testament. It says, these theologically dense verses are made up of four subordinate clauses, each supporting or illuminating the one before it. Paul's pride in the gospel is the reason why he is so eager to preach the gospel in Rome. Okay, his pride in the gospel, he's, he's not ashamed of it, he's excited about it, he wants to share it. That's the reason he's so eager. Uh, this pride, in turn, stems from the fact that the gospel contains or mediates God's saving power for everyone who believes. Why the gospel brings salvation is explained in 17a. It manifests God's righteousness, a righteousness based on faith. Verse 17b finally provides scriptural confirmation for this connection between righteousness and faith. This chain of subordinate clauses is tied both to what comes before it and to what comes after it. Note the four in both 16 and in 18. If we insist on interpreting uh, the Greek gar in each case as expressing cause or reason, uh, that's four, then one could argue that the main statement of the sequence is Paul's assertion of desire to preach the gospel in Rome. Some interpreters accordingly question the common opinion that 16 and 17 state the theme of the letter. Isolating these verses as the theme of the letter, it is argued, betrays a preoccupation with theology at the expense of the argumentative and synact, uh, syntactical flow of the text. But first, gar has a range of meanings, and one can hardly insist that it must have the same subordinating sense in every verse here. Secondly, the syntax does not tell the whole story. Grammatically subordinate clauses frequently stand out in importance by virtue of their content, especially in Greek, with its love of subordinate clauses, uh, hypo, hypotaxis. Hypotaxis, I've never heard that word in my life. Uh, in the present case, the language of 16a implies a shift in focus. Up to this point, Paul has been telling the Romans about his call to ministry and how that ministry relates to the Romans. Since the gospel is the very essence of his ministry and is also the message that Paul wants to bring to Rome, it is naturally figured prominently in these verses. Now, however, using verse 16a to make the transition, Paul turns his attention away from his own ministry and focuses it, focuses it on the gospel as such. After this, nothing more is said of Paul's mission plans or the Romans, except for brief interjections, until implicitly in the strong and the weak section in 14 uh, through 15, 13, and explicitly in the, final, in the final summing up of Paul's plans and prospects uh, in 15. In other words, the epistolary material, uh, epist epistolary, <laughs> the stuff that makes it a letter, stuff that makes it an epistle, uh, material of uh, 1 through 15 and uh, towards the end of 15 frames what appears to be a theological treatise. Hmm. Therefore, while 16 through 17 are technically part of the proem of the letter, they serve as the transition into the body by stating Paul's theme. Most scholars would agree with this conclusion, but they would not agree about just where within 16 through 17 this theme is to be found. Okay, before we go forward... Um, approved workmen are not ashamed. That's right, Julian. <laughs> uh, Snail said, uh, yeah, the whole purpose of Romans is oddly controversial. I think it's odd because it seems like it should be obvious, and I agree with many that it's not. Huh, yeah. <sighs> I'm curious what, what he's about to say, um, because I think he's going to get into some of the different, um, beliefs over the theme, but... Good morning, Peach. Uh, I don't want any hyper taxes. Thanks. Yeah, normal taxes are bad enough. <laughs> um, okay, so Protestant exegetes have traditionally focused on either the righteousness of God being revealed or the one who is righteous by faith will live, understanding them as assertions of the theological theme of justification by faith. Uh, so, so it's looking at where... Um, this theme uh, is found. Uh, so most would say that the uh, theme is found in 16 through 17, but where is it? Where's the emphasis? Okay, so let me just give my own thought. Um, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith 
as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. It, it all goes together. It, it feels hard to segment any of it because like it was just saying, they're all subordinate clauses. <laughs> like they all build on each other. Um, okay, we could say it's not that Paul personally is is not ashamed of the gospel being the theme of the entire letter. Okay. Uh, the gospel being the power of God for salvation. Pause, I guess you could say. Um, maybe. Maybe that's uh, possibly a summation of the theme. Is it the extent of that um, gospel uh, saving power um, being to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, also to the Greek? That's a huge focus in especially the first the first several chapters of Romans. Um, but I'm thinking like, well, no. Actually, yeah. The majority of it is once you get past 11 and 12 is like just this picture of Christian living, 13, submission to governments and things, 14, the one who is weak in their faith, um, Christian liberty, that kind of stuff. And then 15, 16, kind of saying goodbye. Mm, I don't know. That maybe if I had to say a summation, I, I think I'd go with this whole section. The gospel, oh yeah, verse sixteen, <laughs> just verse sixteen. We're overcomplicating it again. Chovy, good morning, good to see you. Um, this guy's suggesting it's because Paul just wants to preach the gospel there, but that seems a little strange because it's already a well-established church. But Paul certainly says he's eager to be there. I had a professor s suggest that this purpose might be for this contribution to Jerusalem to go smoothly, and all the theology is just serving that purpose. Hmm. Yeah. Could see that. Um... When Paul's saying that he's he's eager to be there, um, the only thing it really says is that he's he's like eager to to impart some spiritual yeah. For I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. That is that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. Yeah. So like, why would he be so eager to preach the gospel if this is already a well-established church with believers and things like that? Um, where he just said that he's he's eager to, or he wants to be there so that he can impart some spiritual gift. Like we talked about last time, not necessarily having a specific gift in mind, just wanting to be used by the Holy Spirit in whatever way um, the Lord would have him be used there. Um, I never thought of Doug Wilson to be a skilled exegete, but once I heard him suggest that Romans is almost like a fundraising letter for Paul's continued mission to Spain, which I thought was a really intriguing idea. Huh. I, to be honest, I've never really considered that. Um, just thinking beyond uh, the letter itself. But, I mean, those kind of ideas that make sense. Because we're we're so it's easy for us to just focus on this because this is what we have. <laughs> but uh, like y'all hear me say all the time, context, context. It's not just context within the scripture itself, but even the context of who was writing to whom, when, all that kind of stuff. Remember, Paul? Yes, he's being led by the Lord and following the Holy Spirit as he's he's being led, but he's also he's a person and has desire to go on and and continue reaching others, doing what God's called him to do as long as the Lord would use him. Um, and I don't think he had a retirement date in mind, <laughs> so he's just wanting to keep on furthering the gospel. Um, and so while we know his, his, uh, he didn't make it that much farther, uh, he didn't know that when he's writing. Yeah, that's interesting. Hmm. Very cool. Um... Okay, uh, Kossaman and his followers also identify the righteousness of God as the theme of the letter, but they give the phrase a much broader meaning that it has in traditional Protestantism. Uh, 
A few interpreters place the concept of salvation in verse 16 at the center. Still others are impressed by the way in which the phrase to the Jew first and then to the Greek encapsulates two of the letter's key themes, the incorporation of Gentiles within the people of God and the continuing significance of Israel. Yes, um, certainly a, um, a key theme that is reemphasized throughout. Um, I almost feel like this first part, though, is is more highly uh Um, what's the word? Highlighted in Ephesians than it is here. Uh, that mystery of God, uh, the mystery of the gospel. But I mean, yeah, it is here too. Um, so is the theme of the whole thing a revelation of the righteousness of God? And what is that? That's encapsulated in the gospel. And if the gospel is the theme of the whole book, yeah, I guess. But it's immediately going to go into the wrath of God being revealed in verse 18. But I guess you got to have them both. So, hmm. Thinking out loud. It is also possible to view the individual elements of 16 through 17 as each summing up different parts of the letter. However, as we argued in the introduction, the breadth of the letter's contents require a correspondingly broad theme. As uh, in standing out by virtue of its importance in 1 through 15, as well as by its leading position in the structure of 16 through 17, and is the term gospel. Um, yeah, we already talked about that. Okay, so that was his intro to this section, but we're going to get into 16 proper here in a second. Uh, that Jew Gentile theme would be serving the idea that the Jews in Jerusalem are fellow brothers to the Gentile believers in Rome, so they shouldn't have any apprehensions about assisting them. Yes. Okay, yeah, I see what you're saying. Right, right. And that is emphasized throughout so much of it, but a lot of it is also in the context of justification, like four and five um, makes that that key uh, thing. So I, I think I, I really want to explore that idea, that thought, um, what you were saying earlier about uh, it kind of being a, a pit stop and <laughs> just... That, that is such an interesting thing because there is, there's so much. Yes, there, there's like that kind of specific instruction. But again, um, it's like Paul under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. I get that. But like having to make almost generalizations about the people there, not having met the people there, um, but just knowing how Jew Gentile relationships typically worked out, I guess. Hmm. Okay. Verse 16, if we, as we have noted, uh, verse 16a explains, note the four, Gar, while, why Paul is eager to preach the gospel in Rome, but it also picks up the various descriptions of Paul's commitment <laughs> to the ministry of the gospel. Okay, hold on. What's up? Love thy nerd. What's up, y'all? Welcome to the stream. Thank you so much for bringing over your awesome community. Welcome, 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 love thy nerd. How was the stream? What were y'all doing today? What were you playing? What were you talking about? Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for bringing over your awesome community. Y'all, welcome to the stream. Um, how was it? I'd love to hear if I haven't got to meet you yet. Hi, my name is Pastor Deuce, and I'm a real pastor who plays Pokemon, Doom, and everything in between, all with the intention of sharing God's love with the gaming world, because I believe God loves gamers, and so do I. Thank you for stopping by. I hope you enjoy your stay. Also, we have a brand new 24-7 fish tank stream that uh, is is becoming well-known quickly around the interwebs. <laughs> Here's some information about that if you want to know more about that. But thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. How was your stream? Welcome. Uh, if y'all are just joining us, we are uh, working through the book of Romans very, very slowly. This morning stream uh, we call Pastor's Office. And it's just a time to bring you in on my own study and reading and those kind of things. And we're uh, just working through some commentaries and things, uh, walking through the book of Romans. So um, welcome. Hope you'll enjoy that. Uh, right now, we just got into uh, verse 16. Each of these streams, we usually only get through a few verses <laughs> today. I'm sure we'll only get through these two, uh, 16 and 17, but um, it's been good. It's been good. So welcome on in. Glad y'all are here. 
Um, so I'll, I'll read the verse again just for everyone who's coming in. This is Romans 1.16. He says, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Um, and so we're we're working through Douglas Moo's uh, commentary, The Letter to the Romans, a second edition in the New International Commentary to, of the New Testament. Um, okay. Uh, oh, yeah. So it says, but it also picks up the various descriptions of Paul's commitment to the ministry of the gospel in 1 through 15. Uh, the negative form of Paul's assertion, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, may be a literary convention justifying our rendering it as a straightforward positive statement. Uh, I have great confidence in the gospel. However, the foolishness of the word is uh, the fool the foolishness of the word of the cross, like it says in 1 Corinthians 118, would make some degree of embarrassment about the gospel natural, particularly in the capital of the Gentile world world. So um for example, the uh, like it says, the foolishness of the word of the cross. Here, we could pull that up real quick, uh, just so we could see that together in 1 Corinthians uh, one eighteen. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. Um, so that idea of salvation and, and the good news, the gospel of Christ, uh, to those who are perishing, it's it's foolishness. Uh, it, why would you believe that? We hear that all the time. Why you believe in fairy tales, this old book, blah, 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 God's not real. All the different objections everyone has heard for thousands of years. Um, it's folly to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, who are being saved, <laughs> that's a whole other study. That's why it was highlighted um, from a previous one. But it is the power of God. Um, so, uh, yeah, so that would make some degree of embarrassment about the gospel natural um because most people are gonna ridicule you most people are gonna say that's ridiculous how could you believe that you're uh you're too educated for that you're man i thought you were smarter than this or whatever like you'll hear it all um but paul right out the gate says i'm not ashamed of the gospel i am not not ashamed i will boldly stand in front of anybody <laughs> and preach the gospel um we all need to be able to stand with that same kind of confidence in the gospel, um, which first off means we need to know the gospel. We need to understand, have our minds wrapped around it so that we can go out and fulfill the Great Commission to go into all the world, preaching the gospel to all creation, making disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all the things that Christ has taught us and remembering that he is with us even to the end of the age. Um, so all of that, but first we have to understand the gospel uh, before we can stand boldly and uh, state and share the gospel. If you need any help with that, you can always type exclamation point gospel and it will give you our gospel command that we came up with uh, to be able to tweet the gospel. <laughs> so we wanted to write it as fully and as succinctly as possible so we could share the whole gospel in under 240 characters and this is what we came up with after about 11 hours of study and writing and paring it down and whatever um is uh all have sinned against a holy god and sin eternally separates us from god but jesus poured out his blood atoned for our sin and rose from the grave so that whoever repents and believes would be born again to a new eternal life in christ and feel free to use that. Take it. Use it. Use that as you share the gospel. Um, or there's many other ways you can say it. Uh, but if you just want to have something that you can always fall back on, use that. Take it. Run with it. Share the gospel. Uh, Raven said, it says Jews first because it was the Jews that first learned of Jesus. And then after Jesus died on the cross... Uh, the gospel spread to where the Gentiles lived, right? Yeah, so it started there and then began to spread. Um, and so I think we'll get into that a little bit as as we read on this commentary, but yes, yes. Um, okay, so yeah, so uh, some embarrassment about the gospel would be natural, particularly in the capital of the Gentile world. Yeah, you know you're going to be ridiculed in Rome uh, of all places. Absolutely. But perhaps the most important reason for Paul's negative wording is his realization that many Romans view his gospel with some degree of suspicion. 
As apostle to the Gentiles, Paul had a key and controversial role in bringing Gentiles into the kingdom apart from the law. Uh, his, oh, his impassioned defense of the law-free gospel often met resistance, and there are good reasons within Romans to justify our thinking that at least some Roman Christians were among the resistors. Yeah, and that's fair to say. We still see that to this day. Um, many people who will uh, pit Roman or uh, pit Paul against um, against Jesus, against the Old Testament, against whatever. Um, we even had someone last week coming in uh, saying Paul's preaching a false gospel and whatever. It's not a new argument. <laughs> it's very very old. Um, but yeah, that's that's certainly possible why he would uh, word it um, from the negative like that. Uh, the second clause in verse 16 explains for why Paul is not ashamed uh, of the gospel. For this gospel, whose content is Jesus Christ, appointed Son of God in power, like we read back in verse 4, mediates the power of God leading to salvation. Um, so he is the, the mechanism by which uh, the salvation of the human soul is made possible. The term power, as one might expect, is used widely in Greek philosophy and religion, but its New Testament use is in line with Old Testament teaching about a personal God who uniquely possesses power and who manifests that power in delivering and judging his people. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's a good summation. <laughs> really, I, I actually really like that. Um, highlight that green because I always know if I see green. Oops. Then I go back to it later. Uh, okay, I'm not clicking that button. Dumb thing. Thank you. Um, yeah, let me read that again if you missed that. For this gospel, whose content is Jesus Christ, appointed Son of God in power, mediates the power of God leading to salvation. The term power, as one might expect, is used widely in Greek philosophy and religion, but its New Testament use is in line with Old Testament teaching about a personal God. God has always been a personal God. He's not just some off-distant, omnipowerful, omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient being that just floats on a cloud and is distant from his people. No, he is a personal God who uniquely possesses power. There is no other being like him. None. None. <laughs> he uniquely possesses power and who manifests that power in delivering, it's one part of it, and judging his people. Um, he is the judge of all the earth, uh, but he is also our deliverer. Um, so there's just a couple of examples here uh, of delivering Exodus and Psalm 77, um, but uh, in judging, there's just one here, but we can see that all through the Old Testament. <laughs> um, different situations of God delivering his people and many different situations of God judging uh, his people. Salvation and its cognates are widely used in both the Greek world and the Septuagint to uh, depict deliverance from a broad range of evils. The New Testament as a whole uses salvation and its cognates with much of the same broad range of meaning as the Old Testament, where Paul uses the words only of spiritual deliverance. Um, so as opposed to being physically delivered like from Pharaoh's army across the Red Sea um, and out of Egypt and the Exodus and whatever, um, it says that Paul is using the words only of spiritual deliverance, uh, deliverance from our bondage to sin. Um, <clears throat> moreover, his focus is eschatological. Salvation is usually the deliverance from eschatological judgment that is finalized only at the last day. Characteristic, however, of Paul's and the New Testament's outlook is the conviction that these eschatological blessings are, to some extent, enjoyed by anyone the moment they trust Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Uh, it is because of this already focus in Paul's salvation historical perspective that he can speak of Christians as saved in this life. We had a, a long, lengthy discussion about this kind of thing in um, one of our previous studies and a uh, YouTube video that I have up um, on once saved, always saved, and uh, is that biblical and all that kind of stuff. And, and um, I gave like 
evidence for, evidence against, and we talked about like carnal Christianity, we talked about perseverance of the saints, we talked about apostasy, we talked about all those kind of things, and then uh, evidence for and against all that. And then at the end, I give the way that I lean, and the way that I lean is almost entirely based on my understanding of when we are saved, like when I am justified before God, when I am made new. Um, and uh, that's a reminder <laughs> of uh, what it's saying here. It is because of this already focus in Paul's his, uh, salvation historical perspective that he can speak of Christians as saved in this life. Uh, like we just looked at in 1 Corinthians, those who are being saved, that process of being saved, um, it's not, <laughs> salvation isn't just something that happens on the other side of eternity. Um, there's justification, there's sanctification, and then ultimately there's glorification. Uh, is this a Bible study with Azalea Town playing in the background? I think I'll stay for a bit. Yes. <laughs> Welcome. Uh, uh, oh, I'm going to say, I'm going to butcher your name. Uh, Vari. Can I say Vari? Um, welcome. <laughs> so good to have you. Yeah. Um, if I haven't got to meet you, hi, I'm, uh, my name's Pastor Deuston. I'm a real pastor who plays Pokemon, Doom, and everything in between, all with the intention of sharing God's love with the gaming world, because I believe God loves gamers, and so do I. Thank you for stopping by. I hope you enjoy your stay. Um, yes, Azalea Town particularly is one of my favorite Pokemon tracks. Um, Raven said, I took a screenshot because I liked how the text explained it too. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like the way it said that. Vari works. Okay, perfect. We'll go with Vari. Okay. Um, do, 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 do. Where were we? Oh, yeah, yeah. So um, how he can speak of Christians as saved in this life. Um, so like I said, there's there's kind of three steps in that. There's justification, uh, where we are made new, where we are born again, where Jesus said, unless you're born again, you can't see the kingdom of God. Um, so where we're born again, that's justification. We're made right. We're cleansed of our sin and made a new creation. Um, but then there's the lifelong process of sanctification, often through trials, through difficulties in life. Um, there's this process of being molded and conformed into the image of Christ. Um, and then ultimately, on the other side of eternity, once we die and we are in the presence of God and there is no more flesh, no more sin, no more anything, that is where we are glorified. So there's justification, there's sanctification, and there's glorification. But all of that is a part of salvation. It's an all-encompassing term there. Uh, let's see. That's awesome. I think Sister uh, uh, Abby recommended you. Nice. I love Abby. <laughs> Abby's one of my favorite streamers, just period. Um, Golden Guy, hey, good to see you again. I love that you have Geo as your channel points. That's right. <laughs> Hollow Knight's one of my favorite games of all time. I've played it countless times, platinumed it on multiple platforms, and I love, love, love Hollow Knight. It's it's so good. There's still one thing I have never been able to do in Hollow Knight. Um, it's driving me crazy because I'm on a time limit now because Silk Song will be out sometime this year, and uh, I still haven't been able to beat Pantheon 5 with all the bindings on at the same time. I can't get past Markoth when I try that. It drives me crazy. But yes, I love Hollow Knight. Um, and I love uh, uh, Abby. She's awesome. Uh, Grap, hey, good to see you. I have one minute to say good morning, all. Good morning, Grap. <laughs> Thank you for using your minute to be able to pop in and say hi. <laughs> good to have you. Uh, it sounds like you got a busy day going on. Uh, that's actually why I was about five minutes late. We had a busy morning. We were helping a, a widow from our church, me and uh, four other men from our church. We were helping her move. Um, and I was keeping an eye on the, the clock just to see if we were even going to be able to do our stream. But Yep, we did. I don't have the guts to get through all the Pantheons. To oh, the Pantheons are so fun. I love the Pantheons. But I wish I had just never even attempted the Bindings. <laughs> like I've done all the bindings. So I've done each individual binding on all five pantheons. And on the first four pantheons, I've been able to do it with all four bindings at the same time. But <laughs> you don't get anything for it. All you get is the little texture of the little crystal thing and the, the binding pictures. They just glow. That's it. That's all you get. So whenever I go up to Pantheon 5 now, I just I see the bindings that I've I've done all of them, but they're not glowing and it drives me crazy. Yeah. Lots of rage inducing moments trying to do Pantheon 5 with all four bindings at the same time. But one day 
I will complete that task. Um, but yes, it is one of my favorite games ever, ever, ever. In fact, it's number three for me, my third favorite, right behind Ocarina of Time and Chrono Trigger and Hollow Knight. All right. Anyway, salvation uh, often has a negative meaning, deliverance from something, so being saved from something. But positive nuances are present at times also, so that the term can denote generally God's provision for a person's spiritual need, particularly in light of Romans 3.23 and the use of save uh, in 8.24, which says, for in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, but uh, for who hopes for what he sees. So saved to a hope. Okay. Um, salvation here must include the restoration of the sinner to a share of the glory of God. Yes, I love that. We do focus typically in salvation on um, the the negative side of it. We are saved from our sin, from ourself, from hell, from uh, judgment, from wrath, from whatever. We are saved from all this bad stuff, from what I deserve. <laughs> but what are we saved to? We are saved to God. To He saves us from our sin, from all this, to himself. Um, yeah. Yeah. So it uh, must include the restoration of the sinner to a share of the glory of God. I love that. It's good. The last part of verse 16 introduces themes that recur as key motifs throughout Romans. Uh, first, God's salvific power is available to everyone who believes. Uh, believe and faith are key words in Romans. They are particularly prominent in 321 through 425. The lack of an explicit object after believe is also characteristic of Romans. This does not mean that Paul depreciates the centrality of Christ as the object of faith, but that the language of faith has become so tied to what God has done in Christ that further specification is not needed. Boom! That's good. Uh, to believe is to put full trust in the God who justifies the ungodly by means of the cross and the resurrection of Christ. Amen. That's good. Uh, Raven, so I wasn't, I didn't mean that it has a negative meaning, but that um, there, there's probably a better word than positive negative. Um, we, we focus on uh, what we're saved from in, instead. That's what it's saying, uh, that our focus in salvation is uh, is a negative focus. It doesn't mean a bad thing. It just means it's we're focusing on the negative side of it instead of the positive side to it. So that we're saved from sin, that we're saved from hell, that we're saved from judgment, that we're saved from wrath. That's that's the negative side of the proposition itself. Um, but we are saved from that, yes. But then there's the positive side. We are saved to something. Um, so you could look at it in the same kind of example, uh, let's just throw an insane extreme example out. Uh, you and your uh, child are walking along the rim of a volcano <laughs> and your child starts to fall into the volcano. You grab their arm, you pull them back out and hold them tight and run away and go home and live a happy life for the rest of your life. Okay. The negative is that you're saved from lava um from death from that the positive is that you were saved to uh the parent and to th live the rest of your life whatever there we go that, that's a better way to say it thank you denali see chat brain is always smarter than streamer brain that's just along all live streams that is a rule <laughs> chat brain where you can think and type is always smarter than streamer brain because streamer brain is focusing on a thousand things and you have like 5% of their mental capacity. Um, yeah, so <laughs> uh, not focused on negative things, but negatively focused on a thing, right? Yeah, you get it now. Okay, there you go, there you go, there you go. Uh, Gemin, hi, hello, said, there was a saying that I heard in this regard, the cross was in service to communion, meaning Jesus' sacrifice was amazing, but it was so that we can be in relationship with God. Yes, amen. I love that. I love that. That's so good. It's a great way to say it, too. Um, Good, good, good. Okay. 
Uh, Aristotle, hi, uh, said, as soon as someone starts streaming, they lose 15 IQ points. It's just fact. It's just matter of fact. <laughs> it's just like um, a, a, a gaming streamer, okay? You're playing a game and like off stream, oh, this part I could do in my sleep. But as soon as you're on stream and there's camera and you got people and pressure and whatever, no, you're like 20% worse immediately. <laughs> it just, it never fails. Never fails. Um, yeah, so so true. Uh, good morning, Aristotle. Good to have you. Good to see you. Okay, so uh, I'll read that that section one more time and then we'll, we'll keep moving. Um, uh, the lack of an explicit object after believe is also characteristic of Romans. This does not mean that Paul depreciates the centrality of Christ as the object of faith, but I love this, but that the language of faith has become so tied to what God has done in Christ that further specification is not needed. To believe is to put full trust in the God who justifies the ungodly by means of the cross and resurrection of Christ. That's what it means to believe. <laughs> um, that's good. So yeah, he's not hes not saying that, oh, just belief in general, believe in whatever you want. No, no that's not what he's saying. It's just obvious. Um, so often... Um, as, as we read and examine, especially the scriptures, um, so many can, can read with such a, a hypercritical eye that we just put common sense on the shelf and we dig ourselves into these weird holes <laughs> and get confused and, and don't understand. And well, how does this work with this? Because we just, we forgot to put the common sense part back in there. But you can also take the common sense and just read with that and read without a critical eye to the text and then you don't have a full understanding of what's going on. You need both. Um, Exotic, hey, hello, good to see you. Uh, King, hi, hello, thank you for that follow, welcome. And T. Pratt, good morning, good to have y'all. Welcome to the stream, glad everyone's here. Um, okay, so let's keep going. Uh, Though intellectual assent cannot be excluded from faith, the Pauline emphasis is on surrender to God as an act of the will. Pauline, uh, Pauline faith is not primarily agreement with a set of doctrines, but trust in a person. Though not explicit here, another focus of Romans is the insistence that faith is, no, uh, is in no sense a work. Therefore, although we must never go to the extreme of making the person a totally passive instrument through whom believing occurs, for Paul makes clear that people are responsible to believe, we must also insist that believing is not something we do in the sense of works, but is always a response and accepting of the gift God holds out to us in his grace. As Calvin puts it, faith is a kind of vessel with which we come empty and with the mouth of our soul, uh, of our soul open to seek God's grace. Yeah, well said. Believing, then, while a genuinely human activity possesses no merit or worth for which God is somehow bound to reward us, for salvation is from first to last God's work. Yes. Amen. Well said. Well said. Uh, tater's gonna tate. Are they good? <laughs> Are they good? Wish you could share them. Yeah, man, there's so much in that little section. Can I, like, put this side on this side so we can see both of that at the same time i don't think so um yeah love that so that that's a, an argument that goes on all the time about uh is faith meritorious is that a work and blah 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 it goes back and forth and i think it's it's very clear um in my understanding my reading of the text faith is not a work um <clears throat> faith is not a work uh, therefore, uh, we don't go to the extreme of making a person a totally passive instrument through whom believing occurs, um, for people are responsible to believe. But I love the way that he says it here, and I think I agree with this well. Um, we must also insist that believing is not something we do in the sense of works, but it is always a response, an accepting of the gift God holds out to us in his grace. So see, especially verse four, one through eight. Let me pull that up just to read real quick. What then shall we say we gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? <laughs> Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. 
Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one uh, to whom God counts righteous apart from works, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. And then you can see this focus from another study. Uh, for we say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it counted to him? Was it before or after he had been circumcised? It was not after, but before he was circumcised. He simply believed. He believed. It's good. Um, if faith comes before regeneration in the order salutis, faith itself becomes a work. I don't. I don't think so. I don't think so. I think I agree with what he's saying here. In this, in in. <laughs> it's funny, um, like Gottfuss, Regenerated, we all go back and forth on this all the time. Um, it's funny, especially me and Regenerate. we've talked about this, like narrowing everything down to to just like, okay, so faith and regeneration, it all hinges on this. And like both of us, we, we agree that it's like an almost instantaneous thing, but we just see it on other sides. <laughs> and um so I've, I always say, and I sometimes just say this just to rile up my Calvinist friends, but I'll say faith precedes regeneration. They'll say regeneration precedes faith. Um, but both of us, I think all would say that it's like a split second thing. You say, well, then why does it matter if it's all within microseconds, temporally speaking, who cares? I don't really care, honestly. But if you ask me what I believe, I'll tell you. Um, but yeah, like he says here, wherever it went. Oh, um, golly. Yeah, therefore, we must never go to the extreme of making the person a totally passive instrument through whom believing occurs. Um, through whom, I think, is an interesting way that he says that. Just a passive instrument through whom believing occurs. For Paul makes clear that people are responsible to believe. We must also insist that believing is not something that we do in the sense of works, but it is a response, an accepting of the gift God holds out to us in his grace. Um, <coughs> as Calvin puts it, faith is a kind of vessel with which we come empty. And with the mouth of our soul... <coughs> open to seek God's grace. Hold on, need another sip. Believing then, while a genuinely human activity possesses no merit or worth for which God is somehow bound to reward us, right? <laughs> for salvation is from first to last God's work. And if you if you argue that it is synergistic in the sense that um, I had to do my part and God had to do his part, otherwise it wouldn't work, then yeah, no, I disagree with you. Um, I don't agree with that. I would say that it is monergistic, <laughs> but not to the point of the person being a passive instrument through whom faith happens, um, but that there is an accepting, there is a... Um, uh, There's got to be a better word. I guess I'll just go with accepting for now. Um, let's see. Don't worry. I'm sure uh, that cent uh, several centuries of debate will be resolved by a few short internet debates. Yeah. <laughs> Right. I don't know if Ordo Salutis is even real. I don't think it's clear these different things are all dependent upon one another. Well, I mean, it happens some way. <laughs> we, we know that it happens. So I guess it's like, why, why care? Who cares what order certain things happen in? Uh, order Salutis, in case anyone's listening and just not aware, it's just the order of salvation, the, the logical process uh, by which and the order in which um, these things happen. So, um, and different um, understandings of that can include different parts like decrees or, or whatever, election, um, conditional, non-conditional, unconditional, blah, blah, blah. Um, so there's a bunch of different pieces in that, but um, it, it's just really one of those things that people like to debate and go back and forth on. But if, um, 
we all come back to and settle on the very simple <laughs> fact of repent and believe the gospel. Um, <clears throat> so I wrote out mine somewhere one day in one of those conversations. I don't remember. Um, but I had it all like in order and I can't remember. I wish I could find where I put it. I don't even think it's in here. I think it was somewhere in discord. Um, but John maybe likes focusing on this one thing uh, Christ's sacrifice does for us. Paul likes focusing on another, and maybe John's doesn't have to logically happen before Paul's or vice versa. Hmm. Yeah. But if we take all of it, if we take all the revelation that we have here in Scripture and say, okay, well, this is a part of it, this is a part of it, this, okay, and then we have all of it, now I'm going to lay it all out on the table, and I want to put it in order and figure it out. Do we need to do that? No. No, we don't. Not at all. It never really crossed my mind until people started asking me about it. And even now that I have an understanding of where I am on it, I still don't really care. But it is what it is. Okay. But from first to last, it's God's work. You've heard me say this a million times. I can't save myself. You can't save yourself. I can't save you. <laughs> I can't save my kids as much as I would like to. Um, I can't do it for myself or anybody else. Uh, that is something that only God can do. No man comes to the Father unless God draws him. Just can't do it. There has to be some kind of drawing. There has to be something. Um, it, it just works. First Todd Howardus, third, uh, 316. Yeah. <laughs> It just works. I love it. Okay, anyway. But this same phrase introduces another recurring motif of Romans, the availability of God's power for salvation for all who believe. This phrase occurs four other times in Romans. Uh, in 322, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, there's no distinction. Uh, 411, he received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. The purpose was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised so that the righteousness would be counted to them as well. 10.4, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. And verse 11 in chapter 10, for the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. Okay. In each case, with particular reference to the breaking down of barriers between Jew and Gentile. Right. So, in other words, um, this all who believe is, is not necessarily speaking to a universal atonement kind of idea, uh, but instead is speaking to um, the differentiation between Jew and Gentile. Um, that's, uh, his, what's in his mind as he's writing. Um, but we'll get into all those kind of conversations a lot in chapter 9, 10, and 11, I'm sure, <laughs> on both sides of multiple instances. Uh, Paul's ministry to Gentiles derives from his understanding of the gospel itself as eschatological revelation that fulfills the Old Testament promises about the universal reign of Yahweh. This required the elimination of those barriers between Jew and Gentile labor, uh, laboriously erected by the oral and written law. Yes, it did. Nowhere does this principle receive more emphasis than in Romans as Paul seeks to validate his gospel before a skeptical audience. Um, back in a bit, have to write something and I can't do that while people talk. I understand. Go to the fish tank. Go to the fish tank. <laughs> That's a great place to watch and listen while you think. Um, let's see, uh, see soon. Oh no, I don't have those memorized. I, I wish I did. I have several memorized, but I don't have those memorized. In, you can't see it, but um, on the screen, like whenever there's a, a reference right here, like 411, if I hover my mouse over it, I see the, the verse. Um, y'all can't see it. I don't know why it doesn't show y'all, but I see it. I could just take credit, but. Yeah, I, I don't have those all memorized. <laughs> uh, what is it? Yeah, just a non-Jew. That, that's it. Um, okay, let's keep going. Um, yet, it is typical also of Romans that Paul does not rest content with a reminder of the universalism of the gospel, but immediately introduces a note of particularism to the Jew first and then to the Greek. 
It is only a slight exaggeration to say that the key to understanding Romans lies in successfully untangling the two com uh, connected strands of universalism to all who believe and particularism to the Jew first. The attempted resolution of this... Why is my mouse doing that? The attempted resolution of this apparent paradox must await our comments on Romans. That's what I was just saying, 9 through 11. But we must say something here about this particular phrase. In opposition to Jew, Greek must indicate broadly any non-Jew. Oh, there's the specific answer to your question there, Vari. Uh, what is the nature of the Jew's priority first over the Gentile? And here's to your comment earlier, Raven. Uh, some scholars indeed have sought to remove any sense of priority from the phrase, but without success. Paul clearly accords some kind of priority to the Jew. Some suggest that no more is involved than the historical circumstance of the apostolic preaching, which, according to Acts, began with the Jews and moved on to the Gentiles. So, in other words, that um, after the resurrection and all that kind of stuff and Holy Spirit poured out and they start to go, they're preaching immediately there in Jerusalem first. You'll be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth, Acts 1-8. Um, but uh, so just literally that it, it happened there among Jews first. Um, and then Gentiles. <clears throat> but Paul must intend more than simple historical fact in light of the theological context here. If we ask what precedence Paul accords Israel elsewhere in Romans, we find that his emphasis is on the special availability of the promise of God to that people whom he chose. However, uh, much... Uh, how, oh, however much the church may seem to be dominated by Gentiles, Paul insists that the promises of God realized in the gospel are, first of all, for the Jew. To Israel, the promises were first given, and to the Jews, they still particularly apply. Without in any way subtracting from the equal access that all people now have to the gospel then, Paul insists that the gospel, promised beforehand in the Holy Scriptures, has a special relevance to the Jew. Which, again, will dive all into in chapters 9 through 11 a lot um because that's kind of the point it's fancy yeah um i wish it showed y'all too but it makes me look smart <laughs> if if i can just spout them off like that um okay oh that's a lovely name okay Thank you for the follow. So, on to the second part of this um, revelation of the righteousness of God. It's in verse 17. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. So, I'll highlight this one, uh, yellow for now, and unyellowify that one. Um, so, for in it, in the gospel itself, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. This is the, I think, where we'll get into the meat of conversation today. Although we need to hurry because it's I only got 35 minutes left. Okay, verse 17. It says, it shows why, note again, the for, the gar in Greek, the gospel is God's savings, a saving power to everyone who believes. In it, the gospel, the righteousness of God is being revealed. The verb translated as being revealed, apocalypto, is an important biblical term, meaning originally uncover. This verb and its cognate noun, revelation, are typically uh, used by Paul to refer to the eschatological disclosure of various aspects and elements of God's redemptive plan. Sometimes this disclosure is an uncovering to the intellect of various truths relating to God's purposes. But in other places, picking up the language and concepts of Jewish uh, apocalyptic, uh, Paul uses the word to denote the uncovering of God's redemptive plan as it unfolds on the plane of human history. So in other words, it's not always just about uncovering the end times things and plans and purposes of God, but also uncovering the mystery of how God saves um, is what's being said here. So uh, when it said um, is revealed for in it, this is revealed, that's the uncovering, the apocalypto. Um, <clears throat> okay, if the former cognitive meaning is adopted here, then Paul is speaking about the way in which the gospel makes known to us or informs us of the righteousness of God. If we accept the more dynamic meaning of reveal, uh, and ointment, hi, hello, welcome, thank you for the lurk and uh, for being here, and then uh, Farrick, hi, hello, welcome, thank you for the follow. 
Um, if we accept the more dynamic meaning of reveal, however, Paul's point will be that the gospel in some way actually makes manifest or brings into existence the righteousness of God. This latter meaning is to be preferred in 117. Um, I hope he expands on this because this, anytime you start talking like this, it's it's where people get weird. <laughs> you have to um, define your terms well. Uh, I have to leave for an appointment, but thank you for letting me check out the stream. Absolutely. Uh, hope your appointment goes well. Thank you for hanging out with us today. It was so good to have you, Vari. Uh, have a great rest of your day, man. Okay. Um, so let's see how he defines terms here. Um, he says this latter meaning is to be preferred. This is a common meaning of the verb in Paul, and as we will see, generally corresponds to the way some key Old Testament passages have influenced Paul, uh, that have influenced Paul here use it. It also matches both the most likely meaning of reveal in 118, the wrath of God is being revealed, is being inflicted, is being made manifest. Okay. And the related statement in 321, the righteousness of God has been made manifest. One key difference between 321 and 117, however, is the tense of the verb. The perfect tense in 321 focuses attention on the cross as the time of God's decisive intervention to establish his righteousness. Okay, seems clear. Okay. Siri, I'm not talking to you. <laughs> what? All right, I'm going to just move that away. Um, oh, Fairy is your wife. Okay, nice. <laughs> well, welcome. <laughs> Thank y'all both for being here. Um, okay. So uh, 321, focusing attention on the cross as the time of God's decisive intervention to establish his righteousness. So that is a manifestation of the righteousness of God. Makes sense. Um, in 117, on the other hand, the present tense suggests that Paul, uh, that Paul is thinking of an ongoing process or series of actions connected with the preaching of the gospel. Um, okay. Wherever the gospel is being proclaimed, the righteousness of God in its eschatological fullness is being disclosed. Okay. Try and read that with that understanding. For in it, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for, oh, well, just is revealed before we even get into the next part. For in it, in the proclamation of the gospel, because like we talked about some last time, um, it's it's easy to get uh, for gospel to just be used as such a, like a high level term. Like what is it exactly meaning in this sense? Um, is it talking about the whole salvation process and whatever, or is it just about the, the good news of Christ? What, what does that mean exactly? Or is it the specific proclamation of that message? Um, and Douglas Moo here is contending for uh, it being the proclamation of the gospel being a revelation of the righteousness of God. Okay. Um, wait, where's chapter verse? It's supposed to give its gospel too. Chapter verse, where are you? Is it in chat? Chapter verse isn't even here. <laughs> what? Well, so you only get mine today, but the simple gospel truth is this, that all have sinned against a holy God and sin eternally separates us from God. But Jesus poured out his blood, atoned for our sin and rose from the grave so that whoever repents and believes would be born again to a new eternal life in Christ. Um, man, I've said chapter verses so many times I should just have it memorized. Basically just 1 Corinthians 15 and then the time is fulfilled, repent and believe the gospel. <laughs> Our gospel means good news. I know it starts with that. And then it's 1 Corinthians 15. Psalm 30, verse 2. Wait, chapter verse is there. Oh, Lord, my God, I cried to you for help and you have healed me. It's not a mod, though. Why is it not a mod today? Mod chapter verse. There we go. I just modded it. Okay. It worked that time. I don't know. That was weird. Um, Let's keep going. Um, do, 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 do. so, okay, but first, um, how did it say it in the first reading? Th 
But uh, I do like that he appeals to how it's about to be used in verse 18, which is a much clearer um, reading, like in that sense of manifest. The wrath of God is manifest, is revealed, is being made manifest because we see like specific things that are happening um, as God is turning people over to their uh, own lusts and, and their own sin and destroying themselves and whatever as they suppress the truth of God and their own righteousness and ungodliness. Um, where is that first one? Okay, yeah, so if the former cognitive meaning is adopted here, then Paul is speaking about the way in which the gospel makes known to us or informs us of the righteousness of God. So that reading, to me, is is actually the one that always, <laughs> like, almost moves me to tears more so. Um, and let me explain why. So if, if the gospel, in its concept alone, in what it is, in the informing us of the, the, salvific work of God through Christ, if that um, is the revelation of God's righteousness, then here's why that stands out to me so much, because I don't deserve that. You don't deserve that. We don't deserve the mercy, grace, love, gospel. <laughs> we don't deserve that. Um, but for God to go through that, to do what he has done to save us from sin and to himself and to his glory and for his glory, for him to do that as an act of love, Romans 5, 8, God <laughs> demonstrates his love in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, for him to do that, that being a revelation of righteousness his righteousness righteousness just means rightness doing right um that doesn't seem right to me i don't deserve that none of us do <laughs> we deserve our own destruction that's what we've all earned but out of out of mercy out of grace out of love out of his kindness that leads us to repentance that being a revelation of the righteousness of God just reminds me how great God is. Man. That's good. <laughs> that is good. <laughs> yeah, Twisted Shots, but he loved us, right? Mother Goose, so good to have you. Good morning. That verse in particular gets me in the feelers <laughs> while I'm still uh, just so unworthy of love. He loves me. Yeah, man. The gospel is a miracle, both revealing the righteousness of God and transforming the hearer. Yes, it is the power of God unto salvation to all who believe, to the Jew first, also to the Greek. Right. In it, in the gospel, there's no other way that we can be saved. We can't earn it. We can't do enough good works to outweigh our bad. We can't anything. It's the proclamation of the gospel. That that <laughs> That is the power of God unto salvation. That's why we do it all the time. That's why we share the gospel. That's why every time we pray on the stream, we always pray, God, we pray that you would send the right people who need to be here today, that you would give us opportunities to share the gospel, to plant those seeds to point people to Christ, knowing I can't save that person. They can't save themselves. But as we do our part in the great commission of sharing the gospel, we're planting the seed, or maybe we're watering the seed, but we can't bring the increase. He is the Lord of the harvest. He's the one who brings the increase. We just do our part and then we pray. That's the part we often forget. We need to share the gospel, but we also need to pray over those seeds that have been sown, that God would convict people of their sin, draw them to himself. No one comes to the Father unless God draws them. We pray that God would open their eyes, open their heart, convict them of their sin, and that they would repent, put their faith in Christ. Uh, Cal Fortress, good to see you. And Sirloin, welcome, welcome. Um, being as holy and powerful as he is, he chose to save us even though we're unworthy. Amen. Amen. He brings the increase. That's right. So good. So good. Um, 
Okay, let's see if we can get through verse 17 before we move into our prayer time. By the way, if there's anything we could be praying with you about, type exclamation point pray, followed by a prayer request. And after our study time, uh, we'll have a time of prayer as a community. And I'll be able, it'll automatically upload into our prayer queue that I can bring up on the screen. We can all see and we can pray together uh, over those needs. Amen. The gospel is beautiful. Can never get away from it. That's right. We need to be not only sharing it all the time, even as believers, we need to be hearing it. We need to be reminding ourselves of it. We need to be soaking in the truth of the gospel constantly, constantly. Um. Okay. I have no idea where we were. Oh yeah. I went back a page because I wanted to read that reading. Okay. But he's arguing for more of a dynamic reading, which would be in line with uh, verse 18, um, in the wrath of God being revealed, uh, being a manifestation of the wrath of God. So he's arguing here that um, the righteousness of God being revealed, that verb tense being present, that it would um, be better read as that this is, um, that the gospel is a manifestation of the righteousness of God. Like I was saying, whenever you start using those words, you got to be certain to define your terms. Otherwise, people start talking about weird stuff. Um, so what would it mean here? Just the high level term idea of the gospel in concept? Um, yes, there's truth to that, like I was just sharing, but um, probably what is more apropos, you could say here, which would also be in line with 15, um, is the proclamation of the gospel being a manifest revelation of the righteousness of God. Hope all that made sense. If it didn't, pause, rewind, whatever. <laughs> no worry. These go on YouTube also. Um, hey, B-Boy, good to see you again. Welcome. And Joe, good morning. Doing a little better than yesterday, I guess. How's chat? I'm doing well. Uh, hope everyone else is too. It's so good to have you back. Uh, how are you doing? How's your dad doing? It's good to have you, man. Remember the other day we were praying um, over your dad. Okay. Uh, so in 117, on the other hand, the present tense suggests that Paul is thinking of an ongoing process or series of actions connected with the preaching of the gospel. Wherever the gospel is being proclaimed, the righteousness of God in its eschatological fullness is being disclosed. Um sometimes or most of the time uh whenever we think in terms of eschatology or that's just a long word that means uh in times stuff um that we try to separate that and just think well i don't i don't like to study end time stuff or i exclusively like to study end time stuff or whatever but it's all tied together <laughs> it you can't separate them um as you dig deeper you realize oh this is all interwoven um, you just can't get away with it. So he says, wherever the gospel is being proclaimed, the righteousness of God in its eschatological fullness is being disclosed. But what is this righteousness of God? Uh, oh boy. Diakaiso, do, diako, di, <laughs> diakaiso, si, sine, theo. The phrase is especially important to the argument of Romans since uh, of Paul's nine uses of the phrase, eight occur in this letter. Really? The righteousness of God. What's the other? Okay, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For our sake, he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Dang it, that's one of my favorite verses. I should have thought of that. Um, but interesting. So the term, the righteousness of God, um, Paul only uses eight times throughout all of his writing in the New Testament, seven of which are here in Romans. Uh, moreover, the phrase is prominent in precisely those texts that are often considered to state the central theme of the letter, 16 through 17 and 321 through 26, which we'll get to in like 10 years. Uh, the interpretation of the righteousness of God has played a significant role in the interpretation of Paul and of the gospel generally from Augustine to Luther to Caseman to N.T. Wright. We can group interpretations into three basic categories. Okay, so stick with me. Stick with me. There's, there's a lot here. Um, because we're, we're about to go into, um, a grouping of interpretations of the phrase, the righteousness of God. Okay. Put that there for now. 
Um, let's see. Uh, Aristotle said, I was so convinced of the miraculous nature of the gospel during seminary. I preached the gospel every weekend to Americans at the mall or other places, and none believed. Then I went to the Amazon and preached to 700 people, and all but two believed. Those that have ears to hear, let them hear. Praise God. That's incredible. Wow. Man. So what does that tell you about um, people in the West? Whew. Is it a... Um, <laughs> Sad to say, a manifest revelation of the wrath of God playing out before our eyes and people who have been turned over to their own lusts. Is it a hardness of heart? We have to continue doing what we've been called to do and sharing the gospel. Wow. Um, hey, what's up, Ping? Good to see you. Uh, thanks to God for the prayers. I'm trying to keep him fighting like Rocky as best as I can. That's right. That's good. That's good. <laughs> what? A pastor can't say an original... Dude, you just misspelled your own word there, Ping. <laughs> can't sat. Boom. Roasted. Uh, are you using a commentary? Yeah, right now we're uh, using uh, Douglas Moo's Letter to the Romans, uh, the second edition in the New International Commentary on the New Testament. <laughs> Ping, I'm not a pastor. I don't have to be perfect. Um... You know, pastors are supposed to be completely sinless and be able to recite the entire Bible in every language. Shaking my head. I know. I'm <sighs> just not there yet. <laughs> um, yeah, just like in the Matrix. Just download all the languages and all knowledge. That'd be perfect. Um, okay. Anyway. Here we go. Three categories. Um, one. of Remember. Interpretations of the righteousness of God. The expression might refer to an attribute of God, okay? So his righteousness simply being an attribute of his. Some have identified this attribute as God's justice or rectitude. This interpretation was widespread in the early church where it owed its popularity somewhat to the meaning of the Greek term diokaisin and its Latin equivalent. Uh, contemporary scholars, while often giving this meaning or one similar to it to the phrase in 3.5 and 3.25.26, uh, rarely do so in 1.17. So in 3.5, but if our unrighteousness serves to show the righteousness of God, what shall we say? 3.25.26, um, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. It was to show, again, his righteousness at the present time <coughs> so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Um, but they rarely take that uh, reading in 117. Okay. And justly so. The context requires a positive meaning for the phrase. Another option within this attribute category takes its point of departure from the alleged Old Testament meaning of God's righteousness, God's faithfulness, especially to his covenant with Israel. This inter uh, interpretation also has an ancient pedigree and has been especially popular in recent literature. Okay, so let's keep that one in mind. God's attribute of his righteousness. So God's righteousness simply being an attribute of him, that he is righteous. Okay, interpretation number two. Righteousness of God in 117 might refer to a status given by God. Luther's personal spiritual struggle ended with his realization that God's righteousness meant not the righteousness by which he is righteous in himself, but the righteousness by which we are made righteous by God. Not the strict distributive justice by which God impartially rules and governs the world, but a righteousness that is not one's own. A new standing imparted to the sinner who believes. This was what made Paul's message good news to Luther. <coughs> In contrast to both Augustine and medieval, uh, medieval theologians, Luther viewed this righteousness as purely forensic, a matter of judicial stand, uh, standing or status, and not of internal renewal or moral transformation. This understanding of righteousness of God stands at the heart of Luther's theology and has been a hallmark of Protestant interpretation. On this view, Paul is asserting that the gospel reveals the righteous status that is from God. So, for in it, the righteousness of God is revealed. Um, okay. So, I, I can see and understand both of those. 
um, that it is simply a revelation of that attribute of who God is, that he is righteous. That'd be the first one. The second, that um, <laughs> the righteousness of God or the status by which uh, a believer is made righteous is revealed, which would also certainly be true because the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Um, let's see what this third one says, though. Uh, Aristotle said, I waffle back and forth on the meaning of the righteousness of God in Romans. Yeah, I'm anxious to see what he says here in this third one. Black Bell, good to see you again. Welcome. Um, <laughs> Ping said, I feel like I'm not a pastor. I don't have to be perfect. It's some cult-related heresy. It probably is. Uh, uh, Molu? Hi, hello. Welcome to the stream. Thank you so much for the follow. So good to have you. How you doing today? Okay. Um, number three. So third interpretation. Righteousness of God might denote an activity of God. The English word righteousness naturally designates an abstract quality, but some argue that the equivalent Greek term diokaisin in the Septuagint has a much broader range of meaning, including the dynamic sense of establishing right, as opposed to just the attribute of rightness. Uh, especially significant are the many places in the Psalms and Isaiah where God's righteousness refers to his salvific intervention on behalf of his people. Um, in this case, God's righteousness would be generally equivalent to his saving action. That really seems like splitting hairs between the second and third, <laughs> but okay. So it is the... <coughs> action or activity of God, not just the status uh, that is um, put on the believer, um, God's righteousness being, I guess, imparted to them, the uh, imputed righteousness of God, but uh, the activity of making one right. Uh, Mog Mogrins? Hi, hello, welcome. Thank you for the follow. Some interpretations of the phrase do not, of course, neatly fit into this simple outline, and it is especially important to note that many interpreters would incorporate two or more of these basic ideas in their definition of the phrase in 117. So let me ask y'all, chat, of the three, um, what do you think is the most appropriate and accurate reading here, specifically in verse 17? Because we know he uses it seven times throughout the book of Romans, only one other time, and that's in 2 Corinthians 5. Um, but the righteousness of God of those three interpretations, do you think it's, I guess we could do it this way. Type one, type two, type three, uh, type one, if you think it's mostly, um, an attribute of God, it's simply saying God's rightness, his righteousness, that attribute of who he is, that's what's being made manifest. That's what's being revealed. Um, Type two, if you think it's the status that is um, imputed to a believer of his righteousness being put on the believer, uh, if that is what is being made manifest in this, uh, in the proclamation of the gospel, because we got to remember that's what's being said here, not just the high level concept of the gospel. And then third, uh, or third, uh, type three, for if you think it is in the active move of God of um, establishing rightness in that believer. That is a hard question. <laughs> Four, I'm not sure. Yeah. If, I mean, I think it, it can be partially all of them. Um, in, if you take what I was saying earlier, if you take just the high level view of um, the gospel uh, in concept being uh, being revealed, uh, or the righteousness of God being revealed in the gospel. Um, if you just take that high level view, then I think that's mostly an attribute. Um, it's just showing his rightness and how amazing to think and how awe inspiring of his mercy and grace and goodness and all that that we talked about. Um, but if it is more so a manifest reality of his righteousness uh, being revealed here, which would go in line with 18, uh, verse 18, the wrath of God being revealed, that's clearly a manifest one because of the very practical nature of the rest of chapter one. Um, so if you take it as that, 
then um, because the, the gospel is the power of God for salvation uh, to everyone who believes, I think it's it's kind of two and three, mostly. Um, okay, let's see. Why do we use the Septuagint for the Greek word on the Old Testament when the Greek isn't inspired in the Old Testament? The Septuagint is, um, it's a good reference whenever, so if you're, if you're looking at in the New Testament, you're looking at Greek and, and whatnot. Um, it's helpful to see how, uh, the Old Testament, uh, Hebrew was translated into Greek, um, it's just good to have like the same word in both instances to see how it was used in different places in the Old Testament. Um, so that's why you'll see it uh, referenced a lot in these kind of commentaries and studies. But yeah, the the Greek obviously isn't inspired in the Old Testament. Um, it is a translation, just like uh, Latin Vulgate is a translation, just like the English Bibles are translations, all those kind of things. Uh, but yeah. Also, why is it abbreviate, abbreviated LXX? To be honest, I don't remember. <laughs> I don't really remember. I'd have to look back into that. I've just known that for so long that it's just, I know that's what that is. Um, Aristotle said, I think last time I did a study on the phrase, the righteousness of God, I focused on that righteousness, which is God's to give that when given makes the receiver righteous apart from the law. Okay. So that, that seems to fit mostly in line. I, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, but with the second interpretation, uh, that we just read through this or <laughs> the second in interpretation, which was like an amalgamation of several different interpretations, but three categories. So more so into the second category. Uh, can it be all three of them? Yeah, sure. <laughs> NCV, good to see you. Um, yeah, could it be an attribute of God that uh, gets given to us for example, or would that be heresy? No, 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 no. No, I don't think that'd be uh, heretical at all. It's, um, like I was saying, I think that's if you, if you view um, the gospel there just being in concept, in being the high-level understanding of what the gospel is, as opposed to the proclamation of the gospel to people going out and preaching the gospel. Is that what he's arguing for? Which would make sense in light of verse 15, where he said, um, I'm eager to preach the gospel to you, for I'm not ashamed of preaching the gospel. You could you could kind of fit in there that he's saying. Uh, I'll take the phone a friend, please. Uh, hello, Jesus. Yes, I have a question. <laughs> yeah, I think it's all of them. God isn't fitting into my ranking system. <laughs> Uh, got ahead of, all right, B-Boy. Hey, God bless you. Have a great rest of your day. Hope the appointments go well. Um, is it helpful because the people who knew and had the original Hebrew and knew it well were the ones who translated to a word so they could transfer meaning well? Yeah, well, I mean, you'd have to look back through the history of uh, the the different translations. The big ones that you would really want to look at in that, in answering that kind of question are Septuagint and Latin Vulgate and when they were translated and what resources they had. Um, and all of that. But the whole idea was just like we have English Bibles now, um, was to translate them into the common tongue. Um, but all translators throughout all time, unless they're doing a, a corruption of the text, a world English Bible or something, um, <clears throat> are writing, uh, and translating with the um, desire and purpose and motivation of making the word of God accessible to all. I think one is it uh, being an attribute of God. Okay. Yeah, I think all three are certainly true. Um, I, I've always just kind of read it, it, it with the mindset of one, uh, that first interpretation. Um, but I'm really going to stew more on two and three, especially in light of what we've talked about today, uh, because of verse 15 and 18, especially. So this is this has been really good. I'm enjoying this. Okay, uh, it's we have four minutes and we haven't even prayed. So let's at least finish through verse 17. In fact, it says every possible combination of the three basic interpretations is found in the literature. There we go. God's action in making people right and the status of people so made right 
God's attribute of being in the right and his making sinners right before him. Both his being in the right and his gift of righteousness and combining all three. God's being in the right, his action of making people right before him, and the resultant status of those made right. A lot of rightness there, but I hope you kept up with that. Um, if you're watching on YouTube, rewind. 10 seconds. A particularly... Uh, uh, bleh, bleh, bleh. A particularly significant option along these lines has been advanced by Caseman. Uh, he argues that God's righteousness is God's salvation-creating power, a concept that incorporates the ideas of status given by God and the activity exercised by God with the emphasis on the latter and the addition of nuances such as God's reclaiming of creation for his lordship. Okay. Yeah, that's a pretty good summation. And in that is already inferred, implied, the rightness of God. Someone read ahead. <laughs> Dee Dee, good to see you. Good morning. How you doing? Welcome, welcome. Glad you're here. Um, Aristotle said, uh, Septuagint's helpful to me because my Hebrew sucks. Yeah, Hebrew is really hard. It's really hard. It's really cool, but it's really hard. Um, for the way, wait, for the only way we can be righteous is a gift from God, and we can't be righteous outside of him in the gospel. Yeah, exactly. Okay, let's finish this. Wait, how much more do we have? Focus, or just highlight right there real quick. Uh, oh my goodness. What? <laughs> we have like 57,000 more pages. Before we even, okay. Are you for real? Dude, then it gets into all of this. But this is this is like helpful study material here at the end of his commentary. Good grief. You'd be in verse 17 alone for like four weeks. It's still going. We still haven't got to verse 18. <laughs> it's ridiculous. There's so much here. Pet that chin. <laughs> Not like this. Not like this. <laughs> um, wow. Dang, okay. Where did 18 start? <sighs> Good grief. Page, it doesn't even say page numbers. I'm just gonna start backing up till I see that green. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 30, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 40, 1, 2, wait, oh wait, no, I went too far, something like that, there, okay, um, let me just read this part because it looks interesting. And then next time we'll just pick up at verse 18 because we're not reading 40 more pages on just talking about one word. Four factors influence the decision we reach on this issue. The semantic range of the word, oh, that's why it's going to have 40 pages worth of stuff. Diocasine, the Old Testament word, uh, use of the word, particularly when it is qualified by a reference to God. The use of righteousness words uh, generally in Paul and especially in Romans in the immediate context. The difficulty is that they do not all point in the same direction. Of course they don't, because that would be too simple. Okay. Real is real. Romans is hard. That's that's true. Um, good grief, Charlie Brown. <laughs> um, do, 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 Klingon or Hebrew? <laughs> no, you're fine, T. Brett. No worries at all. Um, what commentary is this? This is uh, Douglas Moo's uh, uh, commentary, The Letter to the Romans, the second edition. Um, it's a part of the New International Commentary of the New Testament. Um, so you can get it as a, a bundle if you want to buy the entire set, um, the Nikot and Nikinut, <laughs> New International Commentary of the Old Testament and New International Commentary of the New Testament. Um, I have them as a, a bundle set in Logos, but um, you can buy the, the individual commentaries. 
Uh, let's see if it's on Amazon. It is. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, it's on there. But anyway, there are many, many commentaries out there. Um, we're just kind of walking through one because I haven't really spent any time in this one, but I've been enjoying it. It's been good. Um, there's more on this one verse than the whole book of Romans. <laughs> Feels like it. Uh, Romans is the book that makes me consider the argument of the Catholic Church, that the scripture should not be given to lay people lest they damage themselves or the scripture. Yeah, it's, I can, I could see that. <laughs> it's, there's just so much and it's so meaty and so dense and easy to, to trip ourselves up on. That's why I was saying that, um, earlier in interpretation that we don't just want to read with such a critical eye to the text and put common sense on the shelf because then we dig ourselves into these weird holes and come up with understandings and interpretations that are not biblical because we divorced ourselves from common sense. But also, and what most people do is just read with just common sense instead of also looking with a critical eye. And you have to have both. You have to mold those things together, merge those things together. And yes, you think with common sense, but you understand it's inspired of the Holy Spirit and what was actually being said. And this is a different um, writing style from a different context, a different culture, from a different time and in a different language. And there's been translation. And what does this mean? And how does this all work together with the whole of Scripture to reveal God? Um, okay, we're going to call it there on the study portion for today. We're already over time, but that's okay. We're going to take a few moments and we're going to pray um, there's already been some prayer requests that have come in, uh, and so we're going to pray over those. Um, there they are. Okay, sweet.